So many people think they just have to go from one relationship to another because we're so scared to be alone, especially if you're an anxious or disorganized attachment style. But everybody here probably knows and knows somebody, if it's not you, that if you are in a bad relationship, that is lonelier than being alone. It is lonelier. It is harder. It is more disappointing. It is more frustrating. And it can take a toll on your self-esteem, your self-worth, and just everything. What's up, everyone? If you're looking to be inspired, motivated, educated, and entertained, you have come to the right place. Welcome to the Bob Mom Podcast, the podcast where we explore your fitness, life mindsets, and actions that help you become unstoppable. You're worth it, and it's time to finally make changes in your life that will last you the rest of your life. Welcome to the Bomb Mom Podcast, everyone. I am Melissa Vogel, your host. Welcome to the show if you are brand new. And if you are returning, welcome back. You guys, holy crap, hold on to your seats because February is going to be a killer month. We are doing an entire series on love, relationships, dating, commitment, sex, everything, everything to do with love and being committed to someone, we are going to cover it. This is going to be a month that you will learn and grow in so many areas. It's you're just gonna leave going, holy crap, I'm ready to date. I'm ready to take my relationship to the next level. I am ready to improve my marriage. I am ready to have sex. I'm ready to change up our sex life. All of the things I'm giving it to you this month. I mean, I give it to you all months, (laughs) all the time. But this month, specifically, we are focusing on all of this. And I love it because as you guys are growing in the inside and the outside, it's going to be able to be used and applied to your relationships too. So it's cool to watch yourself transform and learn and grow and really get to know yourself, which we talk about in this episode. And now you can take all of that growth and experience and success and failures and apply it to your relationship and dating and marriage and all of it, it all comes together. That's why on this podcast, we cover it all. That's why on this podcast, it's not just about workouts and working out and nutrition and the best booty workouts and, you know, and developing your mind and journaling. It's literally everything because it all is connected and it all comes together. And when you put it all together and you take all of the puzzle pieces that we learn and coach and train on and talk about and discuss on this podcast and just in bomb mom life in general, oh my God, when you put it together, it's freaking magical. It's so magical. So this month, I'm telling you, get a little little notebook, take notes. Every single guest is so unique and so different yet. So I don't know, bomb mom. I don't know how else to say it. It's freaking amazing. Now, of course, as always, I want everyone to have the tools to have a successful relationship, dating life, sex life, all the things. And if you are looking to be coached and you want to go next level with yourself and really get to know yourself, go to the show notes, book a call, look for my Calendly link and book a discovery call with me. Let's see how we can work together. Let's see how I can be your coach to help you go next level, whatever that next level is for you. That could be physically, it could be losing 30 pounds, it could be putting on muscle, it could be dropping body fat, it could be improving your confidence and your self love, it could be all of it. But you won't know until you book that discovery call. I love talking with you guys, especially my bomb mom podcast listeners, you guys are my favorite people to talk to, because you get it, you already kind of get it. So if you're new to the show, make sure you go back, become a bomb mom podcast listener, become one of these people, go back and listen to all the episodes. I don't want you to miss anything, but then go to the show notes, book that discovery call. Let's see how we can work together. Okay. I can't wait any longer. I have to talk about my guest and we have to dive in because it is incredible. I don't know why I'm talking like this. (laughs) So today's guest is Kira Sabin. She is like my new best friend. We laugh in this episode a couple times. I almost cried. I don't know if she knows that or not. It's real. It's so real. Kira has been coaching singles 
for 15 plus years from Singapore to Seattle. She is a positive psychological practitioner. She's a certified life coach and the troop leader of love at the reinventing dating.com. She is also the host of the Reinventing Dating podcast, which is awesome. It's one of my new favorite podcasts to listen to on my nightly walks. And she's obsessed with understanding how love and relationships work from a psychological, emotional, and scientific point of view. She works with singles and new couples from all around the world. I'm telling you, you're going to love this episode. Now, even if you aren't dating, let's say you've been married for 15 years, I don't know, you're still going to benefit from this episode. So don't be like, oh, they're talking about dating. Like, oh yeah, okay. No, 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 no. This is an episode you're still going to learn about. And we talk about the different stages of a relationship. Holy shit, my mind was blown so many times, you guys. You have to listen to this. And then pass it on. Pass it on to your friends that are dating. Pass it on to friends that are in a new relationship. Help them understand how to continue to grow. So I'm telling you, if you are happily married, you need to listen to this. If you are in the dating world, you need to listen to this. If you are in a shitty marriage, in a shitty relationship, you need to listen to this because you're still going to learn. It's that good. Okay, so let's dive in. Take a deep breath. Exhale, have a pen and paper ready. If you're driving in the car, don't just take it all in. Visit the show notes after because you can work with Kira. Okay, and we'll put all the links in there. All right, everyone, enjoy the show. Hey, everyone, welcome to the Bomb Mom podcast. Today we have Kira Sabin on. Welcome to the show, Kira. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to dive into this episode because we're doing a whole series on relationships and love and sex and dating and everything this month. And you are just like the perfect guest to take us through the whole dating world. And I'm not going to lie, like I'm totally scared to talk about this. I get it because you know what? Like dating is the redhead stepsister to love, right? Everybody wants love. Nobody wants to date to get it. That's the absolute truth. That's literally on my homepage. Everybody wants a relationship. Everyone's love. Nobody wants to date to get it because dating is hard. I don't even want to dive in. I had told my audience, I think two episodes ago, I was telling Kira about this, you guys, before that we hit record that my relationship has taken a different course and different path. And the whole world of dating, it's scary. And I'm like, this is why Kira needs to come on because I don't think it has to be scary. And you're probably going to tell us all the reasons why. But I think most of our listeners, if they are going to listen to this episode, they are a single mom and this is her world. She needs to start dating. She's put it off. She's not interested. And you guys, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. And it just, I don't know, from my friends and people around me, it just seems like it's not working right now. It just seems like everyone is missing boat. Agreed. Why is it not working? (laughs) Let's talk about it. So I mean, I have many, many thoughts. But if I can start with saying this, because I say this to all of my particularly single moms, because I work with a lot of single moms, is that I think a lot of times when we maybe come out of a, a tough relationship or a tough divorce or a tough marriage, we may want to huddle and just protect our children and never date again or never expose them to anything. It's me. And the thing is, is that do I think that we need to pause and maybe reflect on like what worked, what different, what can I do better in the future? Absolutely. I encourage everybody out of a breakup to take a pause. But when we get to that place, one of the best and most beautiful gifts we can give our kids is to role model a healthy relationship. Mm, I agree. I can tell you I was not role modeled a healthy relationship. I never saw my parents fight. I never saw my parents even have tough discussions in front of me. I mean, so when I not only started dating, but having relationships, I had no idea how to solve conflicts. Oh, wow. Have a tough conversation. I had no idea how to do any of that. And I'm not your average person. I did not meet my husband until I was 41. We met at a bowling alley in my hometown. I was home visiting my family. He was home visiting somebody else. We were not supposed to meet. We ended up getting drunk on Sambuca and making out by a dumpster in the back. So there is nothing romantic about I love to like make sure that people don't think that I did every step perfectly. It was ridiculous. It was dumpster love all the way. And I'm an extreme anxious attachment style. He's pretty extremely avoidant. But here we are nine years later. We got married at 45 and we have the most stunning and beautiful relationship. 
that I could ever imagine. He is my best friend. Really? He is my biggest cheerleader. He takes such beautiful care of me. And we take such beautiful care of each other. And we don't talk about that enough. We don't talk about what I think partnerships, mm -hmm. right? So I can see a lot of particularly single people, especially single moms going, I don't know if I want to do that again. That's a super fair statement. But I also think that most of the time that's because we don't really see healthy relationships in our in our world. Most of the women we talk to are complaining about their boyfriends or girlfriends or exes or whatever. So we rarely see a functional, healthy relationship. But I do like to tell people I really have one and it's the best part of and my it life. It exists. It exists. I can tell you right now, there are women that are staying in their shitty relationship because they don't want to deal with that and they don't think it exists. And they're they're just settling and they're staying right now. Like they're not leaving. And I'm like, ah, that's like. Let me just say something. I hate the word settling because I think that settling is passive. I think settling is like, uh oh, I just fell into the situation. I don't know how I got here. Instead, I ask people to exchange it with the word choosing. Mm. And that is very different. When we say not like, oh, I guess I settled, but I chose this. That is an active statement, right? You have to go and go, wow, okay, this is what I'm choosing on a daily basis. This is what I continue to choose. That gets us somewhere. That gets us. And I also think that no matter how much your ex sucks or is unhealed or not even your ex, like your current person. Like, we should never be talking about settling for another human. Like, that's just crappy. I don't think we should say that about pets either, right? Like, right. it's just crappy. But like, you chose this. So the bigger question is, why are you staying? And the number one thing that I will say that even though I teach dating and love and relationships for a living, if somebody comes to me and says, I am at the best peace and calm in my life right now, and I don't want to disturb that, I'm going to be like, stay with that for a while. Because so many people think they just have to go from one relationship to another because we're so scared to be alone, especially if you're an anxious or disorganized attachment style. But everybody here probably knows and knows somebody, if it's not you, that if you are in a bad relationship, that is lonelier than being alone. It is lonelier. It is harder. It is more disappointing. It is more frustrating. And it can take a toll on your self-esteem, your self-worth and just everything. Yeah. Oh, I completely agree with that. There are more lonely nights with someone mm. laying next to you in your bed. Yep. <laughs> you know, that, Absolutely. And resentment and anger. And it brings out all those other emotions than just being there by yourself. Like, yeah, I totally get this. So with my like what I do and how I work with people and mindset and changing and training and overall just transformation when people first come in. And I know you're going to probably see this, too. It's like people don't know who they are. They have like, especially moms, they have like zero like self-awareness. And I always, I'm coaching them on the side of like, we need to get to know who you are. So you make, I don't know, better food choices, or you do show up for yourself and go for a walk, or you are speaking to yourself kindly to help propel a better and change a better life and stuff. How does this low self-awareness really affect us in the dating world? <laughs> Melissa, it's crazy. So I've been doing this for 15 years. I don't know if I mentioned that. So I've been doing this for a while. And one of the craziest things of doing this, and I coach women primarily, but I've certainly coached men, is how many people think that they're self-aware. 95% of people, that's an actual stat, think they're self-aware, about 10 to 15% actually are. And what I mean by self-aware, we are choosing our life partner. Do we not think that we should be putting more into it than, oh, you make me feel good right now. Let's do that. And that's literally what our society taught us. Like, oh, we fall in love and then we just think it's going to last forever. Nothing in our society and world or in lifetime just lasts forever without work, without communication, without nothing. You can't nothing. go to your job, fall into it and just hope it works out. But we have this weird magic idea around love that's just not helpful or true. And it's hard. Like, I feel like I'm breaking hearts every day as I, I work with my clients because they're like, what? My twin flame, my soulmate isn't out there. And I'm like, well, your soulmate might be out there, but my guess is you're going to create it versus find it because nobody's going to know how to love you. Nobody's going to know how to take care of you. Nobody's going to know how to communicate unless you tell them. And when we're going back to self-worth or self-awareness, most people can't say that. I say to my clients, like, what do you need? What not what do you want? Not like your list that Oprah told us to make in 2004, but like, what do you actually need to feel good on a daily basis? And most people have zero idea. 
They don't know how they work when they get triggered or shut down or get mad or angry. They don't know how to control it. We don't know how to control our emotions. And by control our emotions, maybe we are the ones who never shout, but maybe we are the people who shut down and we don't speak up for our needs. And that is just as big of a problem as somebody shouting in the relationship. Both of them are a lack of healthy communication. And you can't get to that next place if you can't even talk in a way that both people can hear. You talk a lot about like the different stages of a relationship. And as you're talking about this, is this why people, when you say most people don't get, there's five stages and most people don't get past one or two. Is this part of the reason why? Absolutely. So to me, this is one of the easiest things that people can know and learn to understand what's going to happen in their relationship. Because once again, we kind of believe in this, what I call the fall in love theory, right? Which is you meet somebody, you fall in love, and then we just hope that we die next to each other, like in the notebook, yes. holding each other's hand. Because if they're the right person, it'll work and you'll stay, stay together forever. Mm -hmm. If it's the wrong person, then we go and we start looking for the right person. And I just believe you create the relationship. I don't believe in, you know, and we create love. And love can't stay in a relationship that's not healthy. Love can't stay in a place where there's not respect. Love can't stay in a place where there's not trust and prioritization. Mm -hmm. So the stages of relationships, this is so easy. And I'm going to just really gloss over the last ones, but talk a lot of okay. a little bit about the first two, because I think they're the most important. Okay. The first one is the honeymoon period. It's also called by scientists or psychologists, the obsessive love phase, because that's how it triggers in our brain. It triggers like cocaine. Like it yep. literally triggers like cocaine. We think like, all we can do is think about them. We're literally, like, obsessed with them. We want to know everything about them. We are looking for everything to connect. And we're ignoring everything that disconnects, right? So, oh, yeah, they said that. I don't love it. They're a great kisser, and we're having a great time. Yeah. And overall, oh, well. Right, exactly. Because it only takes me about two seconds to talk to a client and say, when did you know your ex had this quality? Almost always first three months. Came up on my fourth date. Came up on my second month. Always. It shows up. We ignore it. So the obsessive love phase, it's a fun phase. It's an exciting phase. We want to make out all the time, but it doesn't last. And the sooner that we realize that that's just a phase or a stage, it's easier for when that changes to not be so, yeah. oh my gosh, what just happened? So the second is the power struggle phase. And what happens is like literally those chemicals start wearing off in our brain. And all of a sudden we notice everything they do that annoys us, everything they do that is disconnected. And most people don't make it out of the power struggle phase. Like 90%. How quick do you get there? It depends. Most honeymoon periods last about a year, year okay. and a half, can go to two years. And if you think about it, that's when most people are getting married. That's sometimes even when people start having kids. Shit. <laughs> It's crazy. Like when you start doing this, you're, we're doing this wrong. This is my life purpose to teach people how to do this better because it's not we blame ourselves. We think we're unlovable. We think we're too fat, too old, too whatever, too much, too loud, too. And really, it comes down to most of us really have no idea who we are and how to create a relationship. So that power struggle phase will continue to last indefinitely until you learn how to fight where both people win right? So that both people feel heard and you're solving the problems and to be able to resolve conflict. And, and you start to notice that I don't love you or like you every second, but I love you and I choose you. Mm. And one of the things that like when I got married, I got married in Mexico, we did this great wedding and we went down for a week and everybody that we loved, our family and friend came down with us. And we gave out, it was interesting because I just had a couple of trinkets that we gave to people and everything was like, and they lived happily ever after. And I was like, <laughs> I cannot fucking do what I do and have that on anything that represents <laughs> our relationship. And everything that we had, and they chose each other every day. And that to me is a beautiful thing that if we find somebody who is choosing us every day and we're choosing them back, like that's what healthy relationships are. But we don't set them up enough in the honeymoon phase to be able to continue to want to choose them every day because we don't maybe understand them or that doesn't make right. sense or we think we have a lot in common, but then we realize we have totally different values or relationship goals. Right. Okay. As you're talking and I'm thinking of all these things, I'm just, because I know so many women in, in marriages that are dating, that are, have a boyfriend long-term, like all these different stages. And when you start talking about like the power struggle stage, and you have to learn how to fight because you can make it out of that stage, right? But I know 100%. I think you were saying the majority of people 
are in that second stage of a relationship and never make it out. Mm -hmm. What happens if you're there, though, and you're like, I'm willing to learn how to fight. I want to learn how to fight fair. Like, I want to make this work. But your partner, you feel like you're alone in that. This is a shitty thing to say. I'm just going to preface it with this. Give it to like, us. <laughs> that's the kind of shit you should know before you are committing to somebody. Fuck. You I know, mean, like, yeah. before you say, this is the person that gets to be in my vagina for a long period of time. Yeah. Like, this person gets to be in my life. And if you're a single mom, this is a person who's going to maybe meet my kids. You better know they're open to learning. But you better know that they're open to learning how to love you even in the tough times and vice versa, you better be prepared to have tougher conversations. But we don't do that because a lot of times, once again, about 80% of women, if you don't know a ton about attachment styles, I'll happily come back again and tell about them. I don't. So you need to come back and tell us. About okay. It. <laughs> so 80% of women identify as an anxious attachment. And what that means is, is it comes off as clingy, is it comes off as needy and Really, it's just an attachment style that it's a little bit created by family, but I think a lot created by culture. And 80% of women, we love to think that we're emotionally available because we want a relationship. But really, most of us aren't actually ready or knowledgeable enough to have a good relationship. So we're out there, we're dating, we're trying to commit as soon as possible because we don't want to sit with our uncomfortable feelings. We may, if somebody doesn't get back to us as soon as possible, we start blowing up their phones or we start yelling at them or we start checking out where they're at on social media, you know, instead of what a healthier idea of what a relationship and dating is, you go slow because you're not going to know if this person's going to be a good partner for a while. There is nothing that you can know on the first few dates or even really the first few months that's going to tell you whether this is a partner. But it's certainly better when you start talking about what your values are and make sure they're the same. Talking about, do they want more kids? If you guys are really starting to get serious, what kind of role are they going to play in your kids' lives? That is important because mm -hmm. it, you know, because they may already have a father who's a, a big role in their life or role model in their life. And so there's a lot of conversations that we don't have. And then particularly, I see women victimizing themselves going, oh, men, oh, men are the worst. They don't want love. They do. But we are all scared shitless yeah. of getting hurt, of being rejected, of hurting somebody else. And to me, we talk a lot of things about like, well, men do this and women do that. I mean, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard because we all know women who are completely different than us. And we know men. I mean, like my husband is not like what I would consider a lot of men I know because he is such a cheerleader. He does the majority of our cooking and cleaning, even with a full time job. Like we play different roles than the traditional right. roles, but that works for us. We had a lot of conversations about it. We talked about what feels good you know, how to do it. And we let each other be ourselves, which is the most beautiful part of love is just to be it loved is. for who you are. And God. we don't do that a lot. Yeah. You kicked me in the gut. <laughs> you said you should have known that. In the <laughs> but the thing is, is that we're so scared to ask those questions. I know. And you that can't we are it. breaking our own hearts, right? Yeah. We are breaking our own hearts. If you are committing to somebody, if you are letting somebody into your life, into your body, into all of these other things without knowing what they are looking for. And I'm not, listen, I'm not somebody's grandma. I'm not going to tell you when to have sex. But if you also know that once you start getting physical, you can't see things straight, you get a little blurry, you get a little caught up in the emotions, like then you need to slow down. Mm -hmm. We don't date very well for the relationships we want. People tell me all the time, I want a long-term relationship. I want someone who commits. I want monogamy. And I'm like, okay, so how are you dating? What questions are you asking on those dates to actually know if that person's a good match for that? And there's not a lot of conversation. They're like a little deer in headlights because we're so scared to ask the questions, but we just continue to put ourselves in bad situations until we learn how to. Yeah. How soon? Should, I mean, is there like a stage with dating, like date one, you're just getting to know each other and fun stuff. Date two, maybe you're a little deeper and then maybe date three. Like, is there any type of like <laughs> format to follow with? So listen, <laughs> you know, when you're asking the guy, like, I ain't gonna fuck you until. <laughs> I mean, yes. Okay. So here's a couple of guidelines. Okay. That I think are smart that I really like to back things up with psychology and science. Yeah. So number one, psychology has proved that most people don't really start letting down their wall and showing who they are into the third month. So if you declare that you're in love and think that this is the one for you before the third month, 
you still haven't seen who this person is. And I won't tell everybody the truth of what it takes usually two to three years to really see all elements of a person. I completely agree. Right. And I heard a great quote this the other day, and I've heard it now a couple different ways, which is people are like tea. You don't know what they're going to be like until they're in hot water. And dating and the way that we date, particularly in the States of like romantic and going out for beautiful meals and doing these fun, you know, like romantic trips. That's not what life and relationships are like, right? Like that's so it's so we're not setting ourselves for any level of success. I really encourage activity dates. I encourage like do stuff. Oh, that's a good idea. But because anybody can tell you who they are. You want to do stuff so you can actually see who they are. Okay. You're making me feel so much better right now because like, that's my goal in life is to tell people like, this doesn't you. have to suck as hard as, as we think that it does. Well, right? I would have it's never thought of that, but like, I'm a huge gym rat. Like I go to the gym, the next person that I date, like you need to know that that's a big part of my life and there's time spent there and you have to understand that. And like, that probably wouldn't be a bad idea for a date, maybe, you know, of like going to the gym together. How do you behave there? Like, I don't know, because of what I do and how I train, like if, I don't know, that would tell me a lot about them. I don't know. <laughs> but I also think that what you've just said is that's a major value to you, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you have to know that if that's a major value, that that person has to either also have that value or 100% respect your value. Right. Like yeah. we don't have to have exactly shared values with somebody, but they need to be your cheerleader. Like, go work out. Yes. I right. Mean, you know, like, <laughs> yay. You know, like they need to be supportive. They need to understand that this is something that's probably going to happen time in your life, like on a daily basis or a pretty regular basis. Not accepting of that, then that's not a similar value. We look for things in common and that's ridiculous. I live in Wisconsin. You know, somebody's like, oh my gosh, he's a Packer fan. I'm like, oh, shocking. So is everybody in the state. <laughs> like, you know, they're like, oh, they like this TV show. They're a Packer fan and they like dogs. I'm like, wow, raise the bar, ladies, raise the bar a little bit. Right. And we are really have been taught to, to ride our feelings rather than really just attach our brain with that. I want everybody to feel love. I want you to enjoy the excitement of that honeymoon phase because it feels good. But if that's what you think is the best part of a relationship, you're not having good relationships. My relationship nine years in is a thousand times better than that first year. Aww. A thousand times because we know each other. We know how to take care of each other. We love each other. And I think, and this is what I said to him this morning, is that he always receives me and I always receive him, right? I'll come naked, crazy, <laughs> whatever, just hugging him. And he always accepts that hug. He always Aww. hugs back. And that doesn't happen as much as we think it should, in or we think it does in relationships. And we have to fully understand that love is really a back and forth. And if we can't give and receive, we're not really putting ourselves in a loving relationship. Right. As you're talking, I think about how I knew that my first marriage was over when like I had to be like, can you just stop and just give me a hug? Like, cause I love hugs. I touch and feel it's part of my love language. And I'd be like, will you just stop? Like, just hug me. Like, can you just hug? Like, I'd have to ask for it and like make him stop and do it. And then I'd like make him stop and pay attention to the kids and be like, will you just hug her? Like, she's right there. You know, maybe can you just stop for a minute and hug? And it wasn't, it wasn't a give and a receive. And it, mm -hmm. it was like, that was flags. But you are so right, Kara. I fucking knew that in the honeymoon stage. We do. If I am honest do. and I look back, I knew it. I fucking knew it then. I've had a lot of women come to me in the beginning saying I was completely blindsided. My ex-boyfriend or husband and even ex-girlfriend, right? Because, you know, right. I was blindsided. I had no idea that they were going to be this person. And then we start going backwards, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I have this, I have this really great activity that is called like relationship frustrations. And you write down everything that was really frustrating the relationship and how we reacted to it and kind of what fear it might have triggered. But it also helps you see your role. Because I think one of the toughest things about the way we look at relationships and more importantly, the way that we look at breakups and divorces is that somebody has to be wrong 
And sometimes it's just not a good match. Or sometimes that person is just not healed enough to be in a relationship where they can love on a daily basis, right? And yeah. everybody can show up for a few months. Even everybody can do their shiny best for a little while. But if you are wanting to do this with somebody, and especially if you have kids or are wanting to have more kids, we need to do better. You know, we need to be thinking more than does this feel good or does this person make me feel attractive or does this person, you know, we need to be thinking about is this person when shit goes down for me going to be able to be there and be supportive? You know, my husband not only takes great care of me, he takes great care of my mom, who's an 81 year old woman, you know, who is a senior who is luckily doing fantastically. But there's moments like he's the one who will get on the phone and walk through like how she can find something on her phone. He's the one who does that because she drives me crazy. And, do you know, or like we'll walk through like how to get into her Netflix and change something. You want to find somebody who is going all in with you or what the fuck are we doing here? But we a lot of times choose, once again, not settle, but choose somebody who's not really showing up. You know, they kind of like showered us with attention and romance and stuff at the beginning, but then start changing once you're kind of in. These are all qualities of not only the avoid attachment style, but just emotional unavailability. And then a lot of times we make up these fairy tale ideas of what things are going to be and what our relationship's going to be. And they're just not true. It's just not real. It's just not real. Okay, two Isn't things. This fun? It is fun. It is. But I'm like, <laughs> I, don't know, I just feel like I'm getting slapped around in a good way because it's like, wake up, pay attention, learn from my past mistakes, you know, and everyone listening, like learn you guys like you're not a failure, right? We're not losers. We're not broken. There's nothing wrong with us. We just we have to keep learning and growing. Yeah. And we have to have a partner that understands that's part of the gig. Yeah. Right. That being with you like in a healthy and functioning relationship, I know that's the most unsexy term, but it's like real means that you are continuing to get to know each other, that you are continuing to have. I mean, Danny and I, so that's my husband. We do like monthly check ins. How are you doing? How are we feeling about us? How are we feeling about our goals right now? Do we need to change them? Do, is this where we want to live next year? Is this where we want to live in 10 years? You know, we do check ins regularly to make sure everybody feels good. Everybody feels seen, everybody feels heard, and that we're both on the same page. And the problem is, is we start to get scared or we never get used to that. I made him, this is not, and a lot of people are like, where do I find Danny? Or does he have a brother? And he does. <laughs> He's also adopted and his brother's gay and married, but it's not about Danny. It's about the fact that we worked for this. Yeah. I luckily had the knowledge because of what I did for a living. And, you know, there was a couple different points in our first year where it was a little like, I remember I messed up. He was upset, rightfully. And I just said, I'm so sorry. And he goes, that means nothing to me. And I was like, OK, time out. We have to be able to apologize in this relationship because I'm going to fuck up. You're going to fuck up. Yeah. And he's just like, nobody in my house growing up ever apologized for anything. So he had never experienced that. He had never. And I said, but we have to know how to be able to repair or this doesn't go anywhere. Right. And that was something that we had to then like learn and practice together. And it was sometimes awkward and it was sometimes like, and there was some growing pains in, in that process. But I didn't find this like perfect guy. I found a guy who was a good match for my values and our goal, my relationship goals. Mm -hmm. And then we created this. Mm. And and so like, it's not, and I remember the first time, like here, I'm a coach. I started doing therapy in my twenties and um, am a lifelong advocate for, for therapy, for coaching, for everything of just getting to know ourselves better and healing stuff because being unhealed is really lonely. Yep. Honestly, yeah. like being in this constant space where we just feel shitty about ourselves and right. that we're worthless and everything else. But I remember at one point he said something and I'm like, you might want to check into therapy for that. And he said, I don't know if I, I really believe in therapy. And I was like, once again, like, oops, time out. <laughs> Anybody who's in this relationship, and this was very early on, I said, we believe in self-growth. We believe yeah. in therapy. We believe in like going to professionals to better ourselves. And, you know, within a year, he was in therapy. And, you know, and I said, if you don't agree with that, like, I'm going to respect that, but we're probably not going to continue this relationship. Because these things are 
not just my preferences or ideals. These are actually what makes or breaks relationships. Right. If we have a problem or you have a problem or I have a problem. We got to commit to getting some help around that problem or that problem doesn't change. Today's episode is brought to you by LifeWave. I can't believe I haven't heard of LifeWave sooner, but I am so glad that I did when a friend introduced me to them because LifeWave and these little stem cell patches have been life changing. Oh yes, you heard that correct. There are little patches that you place on your body that activate the stem cells in your body, resetting them to a younger state and it uses light therapy. I'm not kidding you. I know it sounds crazy. It's not stem cells from anything else. It's helping your own stem cells in your body wake up and get reset. So there's an X39, I wear it on the back of my neck every single day. There's an X49, it's better for like athletes and muscle growth and building, so I put that one on, I put it just below my belly button. There's one called an Eon patch that's amazing for inflammation, anxiety, sore muscles. These patches have drastically changed my life and if they haven't, I would not be sharing them with you guys today. When you put them on, they start activating copper peptides in your body. Each patch has a different job. I can't believe how different my skin looks just from using these. They're incredible. If you guys want more information, you have a couple options. Message me on Instagram. It's Melissa Vogel. I get people on there all the time asking me questions about LifeWave, and you'll probably see me on a reel or a photo with them on my body. You can also email me at info at melissavogelfitness.com or you can go to www.lifewave.com forward slash bomb mom. There's a ton of really good information on there and you can learn more, ask questions. I'm happy to share all of the patches that I'm using, but I'm here to change your life in all the ways possible. And LifeWave has done that for me. I am like so awakened right now. <laughs> it feels just so full of like new knowledge to help move forward. And, and I love that you have been able to take your experience and your training and what you know and apply it to your relationship. And you have a partner that was willing to do the work. And it gives me hope because I have constantly tried to help my partners. Let's do vision boards. Let's grow together. Let's do a weekly check-in. Let's, you know, like just little things like that to stay on the same track and let's, you know, tweak this or, and it was always me. It was always me doing the work and pushing and not there wasn't the willingness that should have been there on the other side. So I really appreciate what you're saying. <laughs> Can I share a story about, so one of the things I think that that's happening in society is that we kind of assume that men don't have emotions or as many emotions are us or don't want love. And I think that's the opposite of true. In fact, I know for a fact that men have just as many emotions as us. We have not a society encouraged them to express them. Boys don't cry, like all of this. And so they are lonely, they are unhappy, and they, a lot of them are not doing anything about it. It's a major, major problem. But here's what I know that I did early in my relationship with Danny that really, really worked not only for me and for him, but for us, and that I think can work for others. And so one of the things I talk about is not only setting boundaries, but asking for what we need and early in the relationship. Now, as an anxious attachment style, because what happens and what I mean by that is I can talk myself in or out of a relationship in about four seconds flat. Two, I can too. <laughs> right? I got it. Yeah. I'm like, you're not emailing me back or like texting me back like quick enough. So <laughs> we're done. Right? Like, I don't want to feel this way. You're making me feel uncomfortable. Like we're done. So when I was, and I'm going to do a little roundabout, when I was 40, my dad became very, very ill and was virtually dying in front of me. And when I sat into the surgery room saying goodbye to him, because we thought like basically they said he had 5% chance to live, he did live for quite a bit longer. But that was the moment for me, the wake up call where I said, oh my God, I'm watching my dad die by myself. My mom's holding his hand. My sister's there with her husband. And I'm here in this room at Mayo Clinic and I'm alone. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that I'd always been a pretty empowered single. I was never like, oh, listen, I don't need a man to complete me. I don't need, you know, like I'm open to a relationship. But in that moment, I realized I really want this. And I had not really tried. I'd not really tried. I'd never made a priority. And then I never really, I kind of rode that wave of emotions, just kind of like, oh, this person likes me. Okay, let's do that. Oh, wait, they don't like me anymore. Okay, I guess we're not doing that. Anymore. You know, I, I just I didn't put a lot of time and energy and thought into it. So when I met Danny, like seven or eight months later, I was like, I'm going to actually try. And trying for me meant having tough conversations that I didn't want to fucking have. 
because I knew that I was going to either like leave or sabotage this relationship Mm -hmm. if I did it. And so one of the conversations we had very early on, as I said, listen, when I don't hear from you for a couple of days, I convince myself, no matter if we had the best date ever, I convince myself you are out. I convince myself you're over this, that you're not interested anymore. Then I go to the weird space of I'm not attractive enough, or maybe I'm too old, or maybe, I, you know, I'm, I, you know, he doesn't, whatever it is, right? Yeah. I said, so if you'll reach out once a day, we don't have to have major conversations. We don't, you know, we were just, I would say that was about the fifth or sixth week mark at that point. It wasn't like date two, but we were, had chosen to kind of like see each other like monogamously at that yeah. point. So I'm like, for me to like feel good and not lose my shit, which is a benefit for everybody involved here. If you text me once a day just to say hi, so I know that you're in this, it's going to calm my nervous system. And I'm not going to then as easily <laughs> lose my shit. Yeah. Then push people. And what happened for me is then I talk myself out of the relationship. I'm just like, okay, this person's obviously not that interested in me. And then I'm out. Mm-hmm. And I think that I probably let not all of them by any means, but a couple of really good guys go because I couldn't sit with my feelings because my my nervous system and my emotional like just I couldn't sit with my feelings. So I said, you know, and then this is what I said to him. I said, here's why I'm asking you for this. A, you don't know, maybe know about attachment styles. Like I get really nervous. I get very like I start making up stories in my head. And I'm also going to be able to like give and receive to you better if I feel calm and safe in this i'm gonna be i'm like there's probably gonna be a lot more blowjobs not that he deserves not that sure he get them but like i'm just gonna feel so much safer and more comfortable to to be in this relationship if i know you're actually in and you're like making an effort on the daily basis it'll feel good and i was like i literally think i had cards because i was like i want to say this correctly yeah and, and all of the points Right. And, you know, and he kind of like chuckled and he's just like, yeah, I can absolutely do that. I'm like, you can. And he goes, yeah, like, yes, of course. I like you. I want you to feel good. But the thing is, is like, I never told anybody or asked anybody for that before. And the second thing I said to him is, and if you need something to feel good in this relationship, you tell me, right? We had this exact same conversation. And he was like, no one has ever asked me what I wanted in a relationship or needed in a relationship. Not one person I've dated, not one person I've had a relationship with. That is real. Wow. And that became a pattern in our relationship. So when we hit that power struggle phase, we were used to these conversations. We were used to these, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm needing. Does uh-huh. that feel good to you? We never compromise. We collaborate because we both have the same goal of a really good, solid relationship. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, my mind is literally blown right now. And it's, I mean, it's like the most simple things, but we're not taught this. We don't know this. And I we're think not a taught lot of this. No, not at all. And I think a lot of women, and I'm just, I'm taking this in from like my single friends that are dating. And I hear them say a lot of things like, well, he didn't text me back, you know, so fuck him and that guy, you know, if he wants to be in a relationship or if he wants to see me again, you know, he would tell, like, we expect men to do these behaviors. And all we had to do was say, hey, it makes me feel good if you text me every day or, hey, if I don't hear from you in a couple of days, I'm I'm going to, I don't be worried. It's just being honest and open instead of expecting these men to just know, oh, he should have known. If he's into me, then you'll know. Dating and relationships are changing. I don't want the relationship my parents had. Right. Like, I, I'm guessing you don't either. No, I want ma'am. a partnership. I want two people coming together. We're both doing shit. We're both taking care of each other. No one's like, you know, one person who does everything. No, we're both doing this. So to do that, that means we have to have the vulnerable conversations. And here's why people don't like dating. It's fucking vulnerable. So you have to put vulnerable. yourself out there. You have to talk about yourself. You have to like hope that somebody likes you. But because so many of us don't know ourselves that well, we just attach to people who aren't a good match for us. And yep. then we're super devastated when it doesn't work out. Yep. And I think the best thing that my clients have ever said to me is dating this person. It didn't work out. And I always wanted to work out for them because like, never. and they're like, that's OK, because I now don't take it personally. I now don't think that there's something broken inside of me. And that's why it didn't work out. Sometimes it's just not a good match or they're not in a place to be in a relationship. And then maybe Mm -hmm. they thought they were, but when shit came down, like they just 
weren't willing to to talk it through or, or work it, right. work through it. Right. But I also see that it took me opening that door for him, for him to walk through, for yeah. me to know this is a guy who's going to keep coming. When I set a boundary, he'd respect it. You know, and some level setting a boundary is, can you text me every day? Because otherwise I'm going to not feel good. And I'm probably going to like mm-hmm. kick you to the curb out of, you know, anxiety at some point, Yep. which I had done not a thousand, but many, many times before. <laughs> a lot. Right. <laughs> and I've just been blown away by not only like my stories, but my client stories of like when they're dating in a way that we realize that nobody can read our minds, right? That there is no norm anymore for the way we're dating because we are now post me too. I feel like the guys we want to date, they're the ones who are nervous and and don't want to come on too strong and don't want to do the wrong thing. And then we're pissed off because as women, we're like, well, but if a guy likes us, isn't that what they're supposed to do? And honestly, that's all like middle school bullshit behavior. We got to grow the fuck up. It is. Adults have relationships. Adults have tough conversations. If you like somebody, you let them know, Yes. right? Like if you want to see them again, you tell them. If they don't text you, you say, hey, what's up? If they continue not texting you, that gives you information that you <laughs> right. want, right? But the fact that like as women, we're so stuck on this like supposed past behavior of what men are supposed to do or not do, although we don't want those relationships at all, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You have to like, if you, I'm a 50 year old woman and I am constantly realizing all of the weird ass shit that I was taught about how I was supposed to talk to men, act with men, accept from men, allow from men. And not only is that unhealthy, sometimes dangerous, it doesn't get us love. If one person's on a pedestal, mm-hmm. there's no love. Right. Right. If one person's above the other one, there's not going to be enough trust and safety for love. So, I mean, we have to both come. We have to both get vulnerable. We have to go get real. And that's how we create relationships where love is then felt every single day. Yeah. And is that what takes you to the other stages? Because now I'm curious, and you can just go over them quickly because most people don't get to them. Like, I'm trying to like, without Googling here, like, or not Googling, like, so there's basically like the bliss stage. The okay. bliss stage is the final stage. I can make sure that I send you the information for your people, but basically it just comes down to there is the commitment stage and the commitment stage is where you are both committed to the relationship. You both realize that you're human and you're both willing to be there. And is that where you both realize that you're not going anywhere? Yeah, absolutely. And that's when we should be getting married. That's when we should be having kids. But most of us are still, yeah, but most of us are still doing it in the stage one and then are completely like blown away when it doesn't look the way we thought it would look. Mm -hmm. And TV and media do not help that, whether it be romance novels, whether it be rom-coms, whether it be anything. We have been raised by watching the brief 1% of all love and romance and and relationships. And then we wonder why we don't feel the way that we do when we watch these TV shows or movies that are written by people to sell tickets and to sell ads, right? Like I know. Before we started, you guys, we were talking about the effects of rom-coms. And I just took my daughter to see the new one that was out. I think it's called Anyone But You anyone but you or something super cute rom-com you know had me crying at times laughing my head off and I went with my 15 year old and I had to keep reminding her like and we laugh and joke about it but she also knows I'm serious that like these mess with your head this isn't what it's like because and now she's like well I wish we could have seen what happened after because you know they fall in love and they kiss and yay and then it just ends and she's like what happened after And I'm like, there's a lot of work that needs to happen when they go home and they leave Australia and the beach house and all the things. You're starting a new podcast all about rom-coms and like disinfecting them. What disinfecting them? Dissecting them. But I really, and have for years, I am a TV and movie junkie. It is one of my, like, I love pop culture. I've always loved it since I was a kid. And I had to stop watching rom-coms like a couple of years ago because I'm like, This goes against so much everything that I now know and believe and teach. I see it. But I also decided that they're a great tool for us sometimes to know, to see what not to do. 
Yes. They're a great tool for us to see unhealthy behavior that we may not witness yes. on a daily basis. So I'm doing a new podcast called Romcom Remix. And it's myself I can't and, wait. This, and this great, my co-host Jennifer Battle. And we are literally watching a rom-com every week. And then we come in and we talk about the healthy and unhealthy lessons, like where there was a lack of boundaries, attachment styles and where they're showing up and how they're showing up, even just like tropes and, and stuff that we unfortunately have been taught of what love looks like. And it doesn't. It is the opposite of love. And I think that probably when we talk the most about why is dating so hard right now, besides the fact that we want different relationships than we've ever wanted before, and yet we've never had them in a history. So we have no idea how to do it. Women don't, men don't. I don't know why women think that men were all pulled in for a special like film strip in fifth grade and taught how to like right. date, love someone, communicate their sex. feelings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that did not exist. Like, no. you know, like Morgan Freeman did not, you know, do a film strip about that. Like guys are probably more clueless than us. Yes. So we're putting a lot of time and energy and power into somebody who does not know anything more than us, probably less. And yeah. they usually don't have a support system to even go to and talk to about it. They might, but let's be honest, we all know plenty of guys I know. who don't have that many close friends or maybe the friends they do have, they talk about sports they, they talk about talking to them <laughs> right or yeah or it's an unhealthy friendship they've had forever yeah. we're putting a lot of hope and dreams and give away a lot of our power to people who don't know what they're doing oh. and the best thing that we can do is know ourselves get our like skills and mindsets in check so that we can go out date with intention know what a match looks like when we see it and have these conversations that actually get us relationships where love keeps going. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I freaking love it. And I love that you said like how the rom-coms can be a teaching tool too. Like Absolutely. I found my daughter and I were talking a lot during the movie, we were probably annoying a lot of people, but <laughs> there was this one point where, you know, when they first met and she left and then she came back and his door was open and he heard, she heard him talking shit. And, and then they didn't see each other for like two years later. And I told my daughter, I'm like, how different would have all been if they just would have communicated and said to each other and she would have said what she heard and he would have said, I'm like, and she's like, I know. And I'm like, just communicate. So I'm glad I did kind of use that as a teaching tool right there. But there's so many things that that's why I can't wait for your podcast and for you to break it down because there's so many like probably good things that we can pull out of these because they're going to keep coming. They're going to keep making them. I mean, I think about especially like the bigger rom-coms that have even come out in the last year. There was mm. like Ticket to Paradise with Julia yep. Roberts and George Clooney. I love both of them so much. There was the Sandra Bullock one with Channing Tatum. And there's yep. a couple of them, but they're all what you're talking about, which is kind of this enemies to lovers. Yes. And I'm like, why do we keep teaching, particularly women, yes. to that love is people treating them like shit and then all of a sudden going, oh, wait, it turns out I'm super attracted to you. Let's fuck. I right? Know. Like, why are we teaching that that's romantic? Why are we teaching that, like, you know, I mean, this has been said for years, but just like pulling pigtails, like as women, we're like, oh, that the person who treats us like shit, that's the person who really loves us. No, the person that loves you is consistent. The person that loves you is safe. The person that loves you is calm and peaceful because that's where love continues existing. It can't live in the chaos. No, no, it can't at all. OK, one last question for you. So. Where do we find the people to date? Is it okay to get on the apps? Because I have a lot of women talking about that. Like, do we get on Tinder and, and Bubble or Bumble or Bumblebee? Or I don't know if there's other <laughs> <laughs> that made me so happy. I'm sorry my nose is running. It is negative 30 here today. I oh, my here God. Outside. It is negative, like, seven outside, but, like, wind chill of negative 30. And, like, my house is, like, I'm, like, my nose is running. It's 68 here. <laughs> Done. <laughs> You live in California. I, I lived in California. So here's what I'm going to say. And I, I'm one of the few people I know who talks about what I do. I am not a fan of dating apps. Here's really? why in less than a few seconds. Number okay. one, the success rate is about 9%. 9%. Oh, that's low. That is very low. So all of these companies, a multi-billion dollar companies, yeah. keep telling everybody, oh my gosh, all of your friends, all of your family members are meeting online. That's not true at all. It's actually depending on if you're straight or gay or depending on your age, like the average is 9%. It's a little higher for if you're a little bit younger. Mm -hmm. If you're like over 40, yeah. 
it goes, so that's number one. The success rate to me, is it worth the time, the energy, the money, and the drama, honestly? Because people can be shitty, let alone about 30% of people are scammers. So not only romance scammers, like people who are pretending to 100% not be the person that they are to get money from you, there is a very large statistic of, of not statistic, but just percentage of people who are married who say they're not, who are, are in relationships who say they're not, who are not portraying a real person. And we start to, especially as an t- anxious attachment, which a majority of women are, we start to make up stories before we even meet them. Oh my God, they love dogs. I love dogs. My parents are going to love them. All of these things. Mm-hmm. And we've never even met them. I am here to teach people how to get love every fucking day of their lives. Dating apps aren't helping us do that. They're letting mean people in because people can act like whoever they, they want to be. Because you're not going to probably say those things when you're looking at somebody eye to eye, right? But you can text something, you can type something. And I mean, the screenshots I get from women, I'm like, no, this is not okay. <laughs> if it's making us feel shittier, yeah. if it's honestly starting to play on our self-confidence and our self-esteem, that's a problem. Yes. So not only does it not work, I think it's terrible. And then more importantly, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. It is not their goal to get you off these apps. They only make money when you are on these apps. So they can say like, Hinge can be like, you know, the last app you'll ever need or or whatever bullshit that they're saying now. But Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, here's the last thing as women that we need to know, especially if you are using free apps such as Tinder, Plenty of Fish. I don't think this match.com owns almost all of them. They don't know that. People don't know that. They own Hinge. They own Tinder. They They own almost all of them except Bumble. So they do not screen for sex offenders. There are women who have gone on first dates and gotten raped And this is a major problem because now predators will go on there. Nobody is scanning for them. And they use this as a hunting ground for sexual assaults. Oh, my God. Well, it makes sense. Great idea. I mean, right? Imagine you're a sex offender. You're like, oh, my God. Did somebody just put an app in my hand where I can like like seek out women who have low self-esteem and self-worth and then talk to them and then take them on a date and rape them? Like, right? that's a real thing. They Ugh. are not protecting people. They're not protecting women in particular. So I can't recommend something that is full of scammers. Right. Has a shitty success rate. Does not protect women's, like, health and safety. Yeah. I mean, there has been now officially murders. Women who have oh, been murdered I believe it. Mm-hmm. from people they met in online dating. For sure. And we don't talk about that enough and there's a multi-billion dollar industry that doesn't want to talk about it yeah yeah so organically meeting people like 100 percent gym sports restaurants here's a couple of things that i will say a when everybody's like i love when people are like where are all the good single guys i'm Uh like there's no island kids there's no (laughs) island you're gonna have to talk to people you're gonna have to leave your house you know there's no place and even if we said hey go all the singles go here, then people will be like, it's a big market. So the best thing you can do, the number one way people still meet each other is through friends. Yeah, Grow your social circle, grow your community, grow your connections. Not only is that the highest success rate, because I'm like, do what fucking works. Also, you're getting on some level a stamp of approval. You're getting somebody that you know who says, I think that this person's a decent person. Maybe they're not the best match for you in the long run, or maybe they don't be intend to be or end up being as ready for relationship as you think. Yeah. But you're also not putting yourself in dangerous situations. And as women, we have to fucking think about that. I wish we didn't. And I I know know we all wish we didn't. But here's the deal. This shit for women has always been happening. We're now just talking about it. I know. Yeah. Right. That's very true. Very, very true. So I say, like, grow your social circle, grow your community, let people know that you're open to meeting people who they think is a good match, but also just put yourself in new places, new spaces with things you value, right? Mm -hmm. If you are a person who really, really values kindness and giving, volunteer. I mean, I'm not saying anything that is mind blowing, but honestly, that's what actually works. That's Mm -hmm. where actual success rates are. 
And I'm more into shit that works than going on and trying to scroll for a boyfriend in a really comfortable place in your home, in your PJs, and hoping that it just works out. Right. That's not the way love works. No, I believe that. I totally believe you. And I'm so glad that you were honest about dating apps and everything and I said that them. because we need to hear it. We need to I know. think it's destroying love. I think that so many people are turned off by people from dating apps that people have just stopped dating. And to me, that's a problem because I think, and I mean, it's actually science that a healthy relationship is one of the highest determining factors of success, of yes. happiness, of health. But most of us are getting in not too healthy of relationships. Yeah. So I'm here to get people into healthy relationships or like, or otherwise I'm like, women, find your golden girls, get your community and go. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Occasionally I tell my husband, like, you're ruining my golden girls dream. I'm really bummed about that, but I love you so much that we're just going to like, <laughs> maybe we'll let you come and like, right. you know, Aww. cook for us. But like, I just think that if we're choosing a life partner, we have to get smart about it. Mm hmm. Kira, you have been absolutely wonderful. This has been so fun. How can people find you? How can they follow you? How can they work with you? We'll put everything in the show notes, but I like you to say it too and say it absolutely. Proud. I get around. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok very poorly. I'm on uh, <laughs> Facebook. My site is reinventingdating.com. And then I have a podcast called Reinventing Dating. And it's really about teaching these tools. So I'm in a series right now of, of modern or of common dating questions through like a modern perspective. Okay. So I just I talked that. about, I just talked about, you know, is age just a number? The week before that about long distance relationships. This week is going to be about, are you too picky? And, you know, what we should be uh -huh. looking for versus, and I'm going to give your people a little bit, there's a big difference between ideals and standards or pickiness and standards. And I teach people the standards they need to have. I love that. I freaking love that. And you also offer a free course. I want to make sure we say that. Um, I do. We'll put the link of that in link for that into the show notes too. It's like a, what is love course, right? It's actually what is love, baby? Don't hurt me, David. That that that's the tagline. But yeah, it's Amazing. it's literally breaking down the psychology of love, and it's way more interesting than people think. I try to make it interesting, but it's also that I feel like a lot of us are out there looking for love, trying to find love, and we don't really fully understand what love is. Mm -hmm. Love is an emotion. It lasts about ninety seconds. This is so good. <laughs> so. We have to create healthy relationships where that feeling of love can come back again and again and again and again. Right, right. Oh my God, this is awesome. I can't thank you enough for being on. This is just phenomenal. And we have to have you back on because I would love, love to, to talk more about attachment relationship or attachment styles, because I think that'll really help just push this even more. Maybe we can get you in like one more time in February and like, let's do keep it. it going. Yes. Oh, Kira. Thank you so much. You guys check out the show notes, check her out, follow her, go to her website, learn how to love, learn what it is, all of the things. Thank you again for coming on. This is amazing. Thank you for having me. Everyone stay safe, stay healthy until next time. This podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered. This is given with the understanding that neither the host practice of the practice or the guest are providing legal, mental health, nutritional, or other professional information. If you need a professional, you should find one.